what the heck is this? And how is it connected to this airplane and this airplane? Let's find out on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette by request. My special thanks to my good friend Max of Max's Models, best modeling channel on YouTube. Check it out. What we see here is the end and the beginning of two very special eras in commercial air travel. We're going to be looking at the prop airliners and the engine problems at the end of the piston era and the jets and the engine problems at the beginning of the jet age. Plus a very unique solution. Before we get into all the details, I just want to remind you that we have a wonderful offer from Specialty Press. If you're new to the channel, you haven't seen this yet. Uh, if you're into these kinds of airplanes, uh, the great uh, prop liners of the golden age, you have to have this book. It's absolutely spectacular. 10 by 10 hardbound, 200 plus pages, 300 color and black and white photos. And uh, click on the link below. It takes you right to the specialty website. Enter Mike in the coupon code. You get a 25% discount. And the book is delivered right to your door. So let's dive in. If you were flying in a TWA constellation, you'd be looking out the window and see this. If you're flying in a TWA Boeing 707, you'd look out the window and see this. But if these engines quit or had problems, when that airplane landed, you'd be stranded somewhere. Here's the TWA route system. And uh, you see they served quite a few cities. But in the Eastern Hemisphere, if you were uh, traveling from Europe uh, eastbound, you would be stuck in one of these cities or the air airplane would be grounded in one of these cities. And the solution was this, an odd looking airplane. Uh, this particular machine was discovered in Tel Aviv in 1956 and purchased by TWA in 1957. It is a Fairchild C-82A packet. The crews that flew this airplane nicknamed it Antos, which is Greek for the thing. Here's a picture of the real airplane. Let's talk about this for a minute. It was powered by two Pratt & Whitney R2800, uh, 2100 horsepower radial engines. They added a Westinghouse J34, you can see that up on top of the fuselage, for an additional 3,250 pounds of thrust on takeoff and for hot high airport operations. and it had a four-cylinder Volkswagen uh, APU or auxiliary power unit, uh, 36 horsepower that uh, powered the winch that brought the engines on board the uh, rear loading doors. Airplane crews did a stately 218 miles per hour, had a 3,200 mile ferry range empty and a 54,000 pound max gross takeoff weight. TWA diplomatically referred to these missions as unscheduled overseas engine replacements. Would you like to take a guess how many were flown in a typical year? Take a breath, 68. That's more than once a week. Well, let's start at the beginning. This is an early model TWA Connie powered by uh, Wright R3350 radials. And uh, from the inside, they look like this. Inside those cowlings, you've got this machine. They were referred to as the duplex cyclone. Uh, believe it or not, an astonishing 50,000 units of this engine were built in various models. Uh, let's take a look at some of the airplanes that uh, were powered by the 3350s. At the end of World War II, the legendary Boeing B-29, Douglas Sky Raider, Consolidated B-32, Lockheed Neptune, the giant Martin Mars, uh, the early version of the Warning Star, the WV-1, and the early versions of the Passenger Connies, the model 049 through 749. Now, there's no argument that the Constellation was one of, if not the most beautiful, uh, aesthetically beautiful airliners ever built, uh, but it was diminutive in size compared to its competition, the DC-6, the Stratocruiser, and others. So let's take a look. This is a 049 uh, model constellation on the ramp at Burbank Airport with the Lockheed factory seen in the background where this airplane was built. 20 miles across town, you had the Douglas plant, and that was the competition for Lockheed. You've heard the term competition makes things better. And so these two rival companies 
uh, just kept upping the ante. This is the Douglas DC-4 shown landing at Santa Monica, where it was built. But then Douglas came up with the pressurized DC-6. I should mention the DC-4 was an unpressurized airplane. The Constellation was pressurized right from the beginning. So Douglas uh, met their match, and here's the DC-6B, referred to as the thoroughbred, powered by a very reliable uh, Pratt & Whitney R-2800s. And this was a machine that uh, served for quite some time. We're going to uh, see the service life a little later on. Well, Lockheed met that challenge with the Super Constellation, the model 1049, uh, a uh, enlarged uh, stretch fuselage, more powerful engines, taller vertical fins on the tail. And you'll notice this looks like a low res photo, but this is actually a page from the uh, TWA calendars that were produced every year. All the major airlines had their calendars that were used for travel agencies and offices and promotion. And uh, it shows the airplane cruising around oh, 25,000 feet or so, uh, which is a different flight regime than the 30 to 40,000 feet of the jets today. And so you always had these beautiful cloudscapes and here it is cruising over uh, the farmland in the Midwest. And these calendars are now collector's items. But a game changer was the Super C Constellation with more powerful engines and uh, a little bit uh, heavier payload, longer range. And the Super C Connie really uh, uh, became the gold standard for the uh, long range piston powered airliner. Then came the Super G and shown here with the international configuration, 600 uh, gallon tip tanks on the wingtips and radar nose. Let's take a look inside the Super G. Think of this photo next time you're flying Acme Airlines and you pay that uh, 13 bucks for the snack box with the pita wrap. Uh, this was the first class lounge. And here's the first class cabin. Now you've heard the term lap of luxury. Well, this involved a pillow in your lap and your tray uh, was on the pillow. There were no tray tables yet. And I should mention, you see the curtains are closed. This would indicate that it's a night flight. And I say that because the curtains were there to shield your eyes from the engine exhaust. My father told me a story of uh, flying on a Eastern Super Constellation and at night and reading the newspaper just by the light of the exhaust alone. So the windows all had curtains and uh, you can see the luxury service in first class. Now you didn't think I was gonna do a video without a model cover, did you? So here's Monogram's beautiful Super G Connie uh, model from the mid 1950s. Take a look at that photo, hmm. Could it be that the wing was shortened because the art director wanted the lettering on the cover? You be the judge. So here's a beautiful shot of LAX, Los Angeles International Airport in uh, early 1958 with a Super G at the gate uh, ready to receive passengers. Looks like they're starting to load baggage and a earlier model 749 taxiing out. Easiest way to tell the difference from the early and later models, the 749s had round windows and the 1049s had the uh, square windows. Douglas's answer to the Super G was the DC-7, powered by the same engines. And here it is, the right R3350 turbo compound or turbo cyclone radial power plant. Of the 50,000 3350s built, 12,000 were the turbo compound. Uh, these power plants offered uh, 3,700 horsepower at takeoff, 3,400 horsepower in cruise, and produced more power with lower fuel consumption, giving the airplane full intercontinental range. Each engine had three PRCs, or power recovery turbines that you see there in green. Now, these were driven by engine exhaust and produced an extra 170 horsepower each back to the crankshaft, or 510 extra horsepower per engine. The disadvantage was a much more complex piston power plant that required very careful operation and fastidious monitoring of temperatures. Problems centered around burned exhaust valves that disintegrated and were then ingested into the PRC, which were destroyed. This required the engine to be shut down with a prop feathered. And when the airplane landed, it was grounded with replacement engines flown in by the C-82. There's a really nice uh, shot of the uh, turbo compounds on the uh, 1649 Jetstream Constellation. Let's take a look at some of the other airplanes powered by the uh, turbo compound. And that's the flying boxcar C-119, the Martin Marlin, 
the Canadian Canadair Argosy patrol aircraft and the later version of the Warning Star, the Lockheed WV-2. Now, this is a snapshot, and it's interesting to see that in 10 years of development, the engine grew by uh, 1,200 horsepower, and that's significant. But uh, here's where it gets interesting. Look at the speeds. The speeds increased from the early model constellations to the later models. And uh, the winner of the speed race, though, was the Douglas DC-7, very clean airplane, fastest piston-powered airliner at 355 miles per hour. There's the DC-7C. It was a play on words. The nickname was Seven Cs, and it was a, a fully intercontinental airliner shown here over Long Beach. Here's the 1649, uh, 10,000 feet higher than the uh, DC-7 in about the same spot. And this is referred to by TWA as the jet stream constellation. Look at those long straight wings. And the engines were uh, mounted further outboard for a quieter cabin with less vibration. Very luxurious airliner. Now, this is where it really gets interesting. Look at the service life of the early Connies, the DC-6B Stratocruiser, and the later Connies. And uh, this is very revealing because the prop liners with the shortest service life, believe it or not, the 1649 Starliner and the DC-7C with the complex engines that had lots of problems. Now, when I say service, I'm referring to frontline, trunkline service, the main uh, aircraft operating on a route. And look at, the, look at that, 1957 introduction, and they were out of uh, frontline service by 1960 when the jets were really starting to take over. Three years of service. So the epitome of the piston era, uh, the zenith of the piston powered uh, queens of the skies, but very short service life. Although to be fair, they were flown as cargo airplanes for another six, eight, maybe even 10 years, but they were taken out of passenger service early on. So here's the punchline, prop liners with the longest service life. You're not gonna believe it. The first constellation and the Douglas DC-6B with its R2800s. These airplanes flew for nearly 20 years. And a lot of that was that even after the jets came in in the early 1960s, these airplanes were kept in the fleet with their reliable uh, engines and they were the feeder liners. These were the uh, short range routes uh, that today would be flown by what were called regional jets. And what's interesting is that the DC-6 and the later, uh, the early, I'm sorry, the early Connies uh, were painted in the later color schemes the jade age color schemes of United and TWA. Here's the final flight dates for these airplanes. And the United DC-6 made the last scheduled flight of a piston powered airliner in the US in February of 1970. Isn't that incredible? Well, we looked at the cabin of these uh, airplanes. Let's look at the cockpit of an early Connie. This is a 749. Compare that to the first 707. You can see uh, the progress in technology. And here it is. I love this photo. This is the rollout of TWA's first uh, 707, uh, 131 uh, straight pipe turbojet airliner. Uh, this was introduced into service in March of 1959 from San Francisco to New York. And oh, the color scheme designed by Raymond Lowy, uh, the pilots always said it looked like it was doing 600 miles an hour just sitting on the ground. And I, I totally agree. Uh, about a year later, the uh, 707 Intercontinental, Continental, the 320 series, uh, made its first flight, and this became uh, the real Intercontinental Range 707. Uh, it was, uh, had bigger engines, uh, it was a bigger airplane, uh, different wing, and uh, really, you know, put TWA on the map as an international carrier. Pan Am had them also. So here's a TWA ad, the fastest and largest jetliner to Europe. And there it is. They were nicknamed the Starstream 707s with the uh, fan engines. And uh, marketing was big in those days. You had the Mad Men on Madison Avenue coming up with all these phrases. So here you have a Starstream 707. Uh, the engines were called Dynafan engines from Pratt & Whitney. And uh, it was an interesting era. But when those uh, engines uh, didn't operate and the airplane was stranded somewhere, here you've got the, uh, these are JT3s, uh, and uh, you've got the straight pipe turbojet at top, the fan engine at bottom. And when these airplanes were stuck somewhere, who are you gonna call? You guessed it, 
the Fairchild C82, which to be fair, would be just the thing you need. Yeah, I know. Well, there you have it. A look at uh, the end of the piston era, the beginning of the jet era, and how TWA solved the problem of uh, engines and uh, delivering these engines all over the Eastern Hemisphere in a Fairchild C82. Special thanks to the great people who make these uh, presentations possible. And I'd like to dedicate this program to the late John Proctor, a dear friend and 27 year veteran of TWA, second generation of airline family and uh, a great writer, editor, enthusiast. And uh, we certainly miss him. This is uh, dedicated to John. So thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't subscribed, please uh, hit the button, hit the bell. Uh, and uh, push the like button before you, you leave. We appreciate that. It helps us with YouTube. And as always, until next time, take care.